students. On behalf of the center, we extend a very warm welcome to Rashid Khalidi, who is the Edward Said Professor of Arab Studies at Columbia University. He's also the editor of the Journal of Palestine Studies, and he's also played a very important role as advisor in the Arab-Israeli negotiations. A very warm welcome also to Achim Fanayak, who, as all of you know, is professor of political science at Delhi University and is a very important uh, theorist and also an anti-nuclear activist. As you know, uh, we are celebrating 50 years of the center and in this golden jubilee year, we celebrate really the recognition of the center as one of the most vibrant institutions of the global south. Over the 50 years that it's been in existence, it's become known for its work on democracy, on dissent and alternatives. Indeed, there was a journal which called Alternatives, which is located here. It's also um, a bit, uh, become known for its work on diversity, secularism and violence. There's some very significant uh, research also in the area of film studies and the new media. There's also been an exploration of the city, of concerns relating to the environment and education. We've also had a program on social and political theory and one of the sort of new areas that uh, a number of people are engaged with is uh, that of Indian intellectual traditions. There's also a very significant Indian languages program which seeks to build a corpus of social science uh, in Hindi. And what is very significant is that despite the fact that we have a very small faculty, three uh, refereed journals have been launched in the recent years. Bioscope, a journal for South Asian screen studies, uh, a journal on Indian democracy and Pratiman, which is the first refereed uh, journal uh, in Hindi, in the social sciences. Now there's been a lot of talk about the long century. Uh, Hobsbawm has written of the long 19th century and Rodel spoke of the long 16th century. Uh, there's going to be a conference uh, at Yale uh, late in April uh, which is speaking about, um, which, uh, in which the, uh, is going to be concerned with the long uh, South Asian, um, the, the long Indian century. And uh, so we really, I look forward to hearing uh, you, Professor Khalidi, on the long 20th century in the Middle East. So, Achit, may I request you now to take charge? Thank you for inviting me to cheer this session. I'm quite honored to do so. Uh, Professor Khalidi, of course, Okay. Professor Khalidi is, as you know, the Edmund Said Professor of Arab Studies at Columbia. And of course, he's taken on the role that Edmund Said himself took on, which was, of course, to be a very important voice in a country that is very important from the point of view of the Palestinian issue. And his is a voice of great authority and importance in defending the Palestinian cause. In my adult life, although there are many issues that are very complicated, there were almost three that stood out for the simplicity in which you could divide between victims and victimizers. One was the Vietnam War, the second was the question of apartheid, and the third is the Palestinian issue. It's just extraordinary. This is now the longest running uh, uh, national liberation movement, much longer than that of India, in fact. Um, Shell has already pointed out that uh, we have lots of conceptions of the long 20th century. Eric Hobsbawm's 20th century was the short 20th century. Today we have uh, a view from the Middle East. And I'm sure that we're all going to be very, very keen to hear what uh, Professor Khalidi has to say. I'll simply request you to please switch off or put on silent mobiles, please, yeah. so that at no occasion today are we going to hear a single beep. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. The 50th anniversary of this distinguished research institute. Um, it happens to also be the 50th anniversary of the established of, establishment of the Institute for Palestine Studies, which was established in Beirut in 1964. So two important non-Euro-American research centers celebrate their half century. And I'm very pleased to be here. Um, what I want to propose this evening is to re-examine the history of the 20th century in light of a slightly different perspective than the usual Euro-American one. Um, it will be partly a Middle Eastern perspective, but mainly a non-Euro-American perspective from which I'll be speaking. Um, and I, to do this, I think, requires first a reconsideration of the ingrained uh, habits of mind and the well-entrenched structures for the production of knowledge that have created this perspective in the first place, this Euro-American perspective. Um, and it's in that context at the end of my talk that I'm going to talk about the place of the Middle East in the history of the 20th century. Um, looked at from the perspective of the United States or of Europe, the history of the past century looks like no more than the history of the United States or Europe writ large. It's seen as a bright Euro-American drama on a very dim world stage. Um, Americans go so far, some of them, as to describe the 20th century as America's century. This is a very curious appellation if you think about it, but it reflects the unquestioned global predominance that was achieved by the United States from World War II onwards. <coughs> Moreover, it implies that a period of time can be defined in terms of a place, temporality defined in spatial terms, as it were, America's century. Um, the reasons for calling the 20th century America's century are obvious, at least to Americans. Um, by the year 2000, the United States had been on the winning side of two world wars. The United States thereupon decisively won the Cold War. Uh, the defeat of its arch foe, the Union of Soviet and Socialist Republics, was so thoroughgoing that that entity disappeared entirely from the map. The United States didn't just win the Cold War, its enemy disappeared. Uh, recent events in the Crimea notwithstanding. Um, by the last decade of the 20th century, the United States stood unrivaled economically and in its capability to project military power nearly anywhere in the world. Uh, this power touched regions uh, that had been well beyond the reach of American might uh, only 40 or 50 or 60 years earlier. Um, a rise to unchallenged preeminence uh, uh, helped to foster in the American elite a sense of the nearly unlimited possibilities open before their country. One can read at mid 20th century some of the sense of unlimited, unbounded power that Americans uh, felt they had, they had control of. Um, going back to an earlier view, um, an approach that sees the 20th century as especially centered on Europe is justified because the 20th century was the last time when most great international decisions were made in European capitals, or at least Europeans thought so. Um, and obviously Europe's hegemony uh, reached its apogee in the decades before World War II. Uh, the League of Nations was in Geneva, uh, and, and uh, during the interwar era, not one uh, national liberation struggle against European colonial rule the world over was fully successful. So Europe ruled, uh, faced enormous resistance to its rule, but nowhere in the colonial world was a national liberation struggle fully successful before World War I. Obviously that situation changed in 1945 when the enfeebled European colonial powers began their retreat from empire. Um, and from 1945 onwards, it was not Geneva, but New York uh, that was where the Prime, premier international forum was located. Uh, and that forum, as we know, was dominated by the two new superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, the interwar era also was the last moment when the old great powers of Western Europe could plausibly aspire to global hegemony. 
Nazi Germany, Britain, and France were the leading contenders. In 1939, these three powers started a world war, or at least they started the European war. Uh, and that rapidly became a world war in which they themselves were dwarfed. Ironically, the conflagration that Germany, Britain, and France started led to all of them losing their status as potential global hegemons. And it brought onto the scene the two new superpowers. Um, there was an illusion that this struggle between them was an equal one. In fact, I, I came to be of the view, and I still hold this view, that the Cold War was an age of nearly absolute American world dominance. It was not the Soviet Union that contained the United States, it was the United States that contained the Soviet Union. For all the power the Soviet Union had, um, uh, 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 that, was, that was the reality. Uh, that reality was masked for decades uh, by the Cold War, uh, during which the USSR was <coughs> a, a redoubtable rival to the United States and appeared to be cha capable of challenging the United States for world mastery. It had a potent ideological message. It had unrivaled conventional ground forces after 1949. Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. Um, and by 1960, by the early 1960s, the Soviet Union had the capacity to develop, to deliver its nuclear weapons anywhere in the world, uh, and therefore appeared quite considerable as a, as, a, as, a, as a power. However, we know now that the Soviet Union had economic feet of clay, uh, and it was ultimately un incapable of mounting a sustained global challenge to the power of the United States and to the power of the worldwide capitalist system that the US headed. Um, this weakness, which after the fact is apparent, was not apparent to most of the Soviet Union's enemies or to many of its friends the world over. I, I remember constant debates in Beirut with friends, colleagues, comrades uh, over this subject. And I was very decidedly of the opinion that there was an enormous exaggeration of the power and capability of the Soviet Union. And nobody believed me but my friends. Um, beyond these facts of power, um, Euro-American economic and cultural influence were pervasive throughout the globe in the 20th century. I'm trying to explain why Euro-American views of this century uh, were, so, were, so, were so deeply entrenched. In cultural terms, uh, perhaps even more than in terms of politics and strategy, in economic terms, perhaps even more than uh, in terms of politics and strategy, the 20th century was one of Euro-American dominance. The globalized world economy is an economy that was dominated by Euro-American capitalism. Uh, those forms still dominate, even if there are new centers, this one, this country, China, and others. Uh, it is in European languages that the elites of the world today communicate, not in Chinese or Japanese, not in Hindi or Urdu, not in Arabic or Persian, not in Swahili or Wolof or Hausa. Um, cultural forms derived from Euro-American models, whether we're talking about theater or music, whether we're talking about cinema literature, whether we're talking about education, have become universal standards with all of the cultural variants that Bollywood or Rai or whatever have brought to those forms. This is true even in places where there's powerful resistance to foreign, what are called foreign cultural influences. Technology, from the cell phone to the computer, is still, for some reason, seen as Western, even though almost every consumer form of that technology is manufactured either in East Asia or South Asia. From the hardware to the software. My first personal computer, when it crashed in 1983, had a little sign that would go across the bottom of the screen, Bangalore, India. 30 years ago, the software was being made here. 30 years ago, uh, the software was being made in this part of the world, and the hardware was being made in East Asia. Uh, I would argue, I've tried to lay out why this Euro-centric or Euro-American-centric approach has a certain logic, but I would argue that this logic is profoundly flawed. It means that the history of the entire world tends to be seen from a particular metropolitan point of view, one that diminishes everything that is apprehended as a distance. I, I was advised to bring a slide 
and use a PowerPoint, but I am allergic to PowerPoint. <laughs> so I will describe for you something that I hope will illustrate what I've just said. This particular metropolitan point of view that diminishes everything apprehended in the distance. Some of you may have seen a cartoon, which was the cover of the magazine The New Yorker, by a man named Steinberg. It shows the world as seen from Manhattan's east side, and it shows the west side in diminishing perspective, and then the Hudson River, and then little dots and bumps across the American continent, and then there's a tiny little sliver of Pacific, China, Japan, dots. <laughs> uh, now, this is the view of history that Euro-America has. Uh, uh, obviously, Steinberg's vision is a reasonably accurate portrayal of how many New Yorkers, especially East Siders, <laughs> see the rest of the world. But it's not a very useful map of the world for any other purposes than talking about how benighted New Yorkers are. <clears throat> it won't tell you anything about California or Japan or any other part of the world that's not visible from a window on the east side of Manhattan. <laughs> this kind of view uh, also ensures that the history and everything else about the rest of the world is seen through the lenses of metropolitan myopia, insularity, and provinciality. Because of the power of, the, the concentration of power and wealth in the imperial metropole or metropoles, and because of the purchase over others that this power and wealth bring them, uh, the denizens of that metropole naturally fancy themselves as being sophisticated, all knowing, and cosmopolitan. Uh, in reality, those at the imperial center are frequently quite ignorant of the corners of the world that their power enables them to dominate. Now, I could talk about the American case. I won't. I could talk about how little power in the United States draws on real expertise. Uh, I won't. Uh, it would sound like sour grapes. Um, but trust me, there's a great deal of expertise in the United States. It's not really very seriously taken uh, into account by policymakers uh, most of the time. Um, let me go on to say that while a metropolitan perspective, the Steinberg perspective, we can call it, privileges the great impact of Europe and the United States on the rest of the world, it slights the possibility that events and trends that originate elsewhere may have been crucial to determining both local and global outcomes, or that they may have been more important than what was happening at the center. It's a common conceit of the powerful that everything that concerns or preoccupies them is important, and that all important things begin with them. In the 20th century, which was one of unrivaled Euro-American power, uh, we saw these preoccupations uh, elevated to matters of universal concern. Um, I, I give as examples in the, in the paper on which this talk is based, the, um, the cases of fascism and anti-Semitism. Nowhere outside of Euro-America, but particularly Europe, did these two phenomena have the profound and corrosive impact that they had in Europe. They led to World War II, they led to the Holocaust. They are, they are quintessentially European phenomena. Um, but beyond that, uh, they, and, and they're central to our understanding of European history, obviously, but beyond that, they were not truly global world historical phenomena. They did not have ramifications in societies all over the globe. And there are many ideologies that originated in Europe that were much more important than they were. Um, I, I, I could talk about how uh, European and American conceit regarding the disappearance of religion from Euro-American uh, political life uh, led to the assumption that the same thing would happen in the rest of the world. In fact, it hasn't disappeared from Euro-American political life. But the belief that it had, the liberal conceit that it had, led to the assumption that the same thing was true everywhere else, what was true in Europe, uh, uh, is necessarily, or in the United States, is necessarily true everywhere else. Um, even more seriously, this Euro-American-centric approach means that the history of Europe and Europe's North American and Australian offspring, uh, and the historical categories that are derived from this history, are seen as universally applicable. Forms that religion, or the state, or the nation, or societies took in the West are seen as the most appropriate and sometimes the only models uh, for the rest of the globe. Uh, thus, the history of the United States and Europe is understood in some senses as a template for world history. 
Uh, there's been pushback at this notion. My, my former colleague, Dipesh Chakravarti, noted that in his erudite book, Provincializing Europe, uh, saying that, and I'm quoting Dipesh now, insofar as the academic discourse of history is concerned, Europe remains the sovereign theoretical subject of all histories, including the ones we call Indian, Chinese, Kenyan, and so on. So, according to Dipesh, and I agree with him, uh, Europe, or Euro-America as I'm calling it, remain at the center of many academics' concerns, and are, it's all, that's always the unspoken referent, even when it's nominally not there. Um, there are many consequences of this situation. One of them is that the connections between what are called peripheries are rarely studied as carefully as connections between the center and its supposed satellites. Everything is seen in terms of a hub and spoke relationship, and the emphasis is always on the hub. Uh, and this is obviously a reflection of the biases within the old colonial era networks centered on London or Paris or wherever. Uh, these networks are obviously important. This, these hubs obviously radiated influence. And many of them have resilience to this day. But strong connections existed between the so-called peripheries, and in many cases were much more important than was realized. Uh, there are innumerable examples of such understudied phenomena. The colonial interpenetration of Britain with India, or of Britain with Egypt, or of Britain with Ireland, or of Britain with Iraq or Palestine, in each case has been studied exhaustively bilaterally, both by British and by non-British scholars. And obviously these dyads, these bilateral relationships are important. Um, but much less has been done to examine how Ireland or India may have affected Egypt, or may have affected Iraq, or how what was learned here by Cromer as financial secretary was then applied in, in Egypt, and then was taken from Egypt to Palestine and Iraq, uh, or taken from here to the Gulf and then to Iraq. Uh, similarly, one can talk about French colonial experiences operating in the same way. It turns out, I learned this from one of my students, that Egyptian nationalists were not only paying attention to the British, they were paying attention to Indian nationalists. They were much aided by Irish nationalists, and they read the writings of radicals, nationalists, and revolutionaries from other colonized countries, highly conscious of their experiences. In those countries where there was some freedom of the press, there were constant articles about the examples of other nationalist movements. Palestinian press was full of articles on India, for example. Um, there was, in other words, a sort of revolutionary nationalist international alongside the internationals set up by the Social Democratic parties and the Bolshevik party. Similarly, one of the leaders, and again, this is the result of work of one of my own students, leaders of one of the most important Palestinian nationalist groups in the interwar period, the Istiklal Party, Independence Party, paid close attention to the tactics of the Congress Party in India and emulated it to the best of their ability. They were fiercely opposed by the British because they understood exactly how dangerous that example was. And they were having, they're struggling to control uh, Congress here uh, in the 20s and the 30s. Uh, in Egypt, uh, at the turn of the century, in Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, at the same period, uh, ideas about modernization and change, I ideas about how to resist imperialism uh, and how to maintain some specificities of these societies were derived, in fact, largely not from the West, but often from Asiatic Japan. The defeat of Russia in 1905 was like an earthquake across the colonial world. Here, the Middle East, many other countries, China, uh, the, the fact that a, a non-European power had succeeded in defeating a major imperialist power had an enormous impact. Um, I could go on and talk about other ways in which uh, the, 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 the peripheries, so-called, uh, influenced one another. Uh, historians have shown uh, that the colonial links of Britain to various Arab countries, for example, largely ran through this city, through Delhi, before Calcutta, or through Simla when they would go up in the summer to avoid England. <laughs> but the Brits ran a large part of this world, of our world in the Middle East, from here. It was the Indian Navy, it was the Indian Civil Service, it was the Indian Intelligence Service that governed uh, large parts of the Arab world. 
Um, and uh, uh, this was true, uh, mutatis mutandi, of other parts uh, of the colonial world. Um, I would argue that highlighting these so-called peripheral connections doesn't even do justice to the range of connections between South Asia and parts of the Middle East, especially the Gulf. Some of these connections were long-standing and enduring, and they involved merchant capital, migrant workers, cultural influences, going back centuries and sometimes millennia. Uh, this relation antedated the colonial era, this relation has survived the colonial era, and it's thriving uh, if you go to the Gulf. Uh, South Asia is in the Gulf, and the Gulf is in South Asia in various ways. Um, and it's not surprising in view of the fact that Dubai, Dubai is closer to Karachi or to Mumbai than it is to Damascus. It's physically closer. It takes you less time to get from there to here than it does to get from there to Beirut, Dubai. Um, and that, that, that distance is not just in air miles, that distance is also a cultural distance. Um, it's not surprising that such connections tend to be forgotten in the light of modern nationalist <laughs> pieties, whether Indian nationalism or Arab nationalism or any other nationalism, uh, which in, in turn is mirrored in much of the work that's done in area studies and other fields, and it causes an obsessive focus on the national unit and on its presumed continuity of ancient boundaries, which necessarily leads to an undervaluation of the kind of transregional and transnational connections. Um, moreover, far too little attention is given to the fact that in bilateral colonial relationships, influence did not only flow one way, it flowed both ways. Colonial power was frequently deeply affected by that relationship. Uh, and and those, those, those effects uh, continue to the present day. This is true whether we're talking about the impact of ex-colonial immigration to European countries, South Asians and Arabs in Paris and in, and in London. Uh, it's true whether we're talking about the social and, and, and economic impact of colonial wars on the metropole, Indochina, uh, Algeria, Vietnam, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan in the past decade. Um, the idea which is prevalent in Euro-America that the colonial experience only marked the dark colonized peoples and that the white colonizers glided untouched and unaffected through the colonial era is in itself a colonial conceit and is completely false. The colonizer was indelibly changed as well in innumerable ways. This included the impact of colonial empires on metropolitan forms of governance, on metropolitan constitutional regimes. It included the social and economic impact flow of colonial surpluses back to the metropole. Bath is built with Indian money. The crescents in Bath, the, 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 the entire structure of that 18th century city is looted from here. The idea that Britain affected India and India didn't affect Britain is ludicrous uh, in terms of those kinds of flows of capital. Uh, it's true in terms of the eruption into the domestic politics of, col of, 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 of colonial problems or of colonial armies. The Spanish Civil War was won not by Spanish phalangists, Spanish-speaking soldiers. It was won by a North African colonial army of Arabs and Berbers that the, that the Spanish had recruited to fight their colonial wars, whom Franco brought across the Straits and used to destroy the Republic. This is not a colonial impact on the metropole. The entire course of Spanish history is changed by the fact that Franco had divisions of North Africans to fight his filthy war with uh, in the Spanish Civil War. And that's only one case. Uh, Europe could not have fought either of the world wars as they did, especially the, the, the Western colonial powers, Britain and France, without division after division after division of South Asians and Middle Easterners and North Africans and West Africans. Entire divisions of Senegalese and, and Algerian and Moroccan troops were the entire landing force in Provence in 1944. The Americans had several divisions, and the French had several divisions. One division was made up of Frenchmen, the arm, first armored division headed by Leclerc. The entirety of the French army that landed was North African and West African, the entirety of that army. It was an Algerian and a Moroccan rifle division that liberated Marseille in the summer of 1944, with 5,000 soldiers killed in a week. <laughs> 
So the idea that only the colonies are affected by colonialism and that the metropole is untouched uh, is simply untenable in light of these kinds of examples. Now, another consequence of what Dupesh Chakravarti calls the provinciality of Europe is the same, a certain kind of shrinking of history to focus on the highlights of the epic of Euro-American ascendancy and an attitude whereby everything else is either seen as a prologue to this European hegemony uh, or is marginal at best. Um, we can see this set of conceits in the makeup of the history departments in most major American universities. In fact, most American universities, major or minor. The overwhelming majority of the faculty in these departments focus on American and European topics together as what is perceived to be the antecedents of America and Europe in classical Greece or classical Rome or whatever other extensions or adjuncts they choose to annex to European or Western history. Um, so this is what determines faculty, faculty hiring, this is what determines courses, and so forth. Uh, the stress is on the era of uh, Euro-American global ascendancy and what led up to it. Um, now, this is understandable up to a point. American history is the national history of Americans. People are interested in their own past. Uh, Europe and the United States do and did, and the United States still does dominate the world. Uh, the United States is, in a certain sense, the offspring of Europe. So a certain, a certain focus on these regions is justifiable. But the result is that in most American, in fact, all American history departments that I'm aware of, uh, the least attention is devoted to the areas that have the most, or at least the longest, history. So the least attention is devoted to acres of terrain and millennia of history, South Asia and East Asia and the Middle East and West Africa and so forth. And uh, the most attention, the most time, the number, largest number of courses and so forth, are, is devoted to the area that has the least or at least the shortest history, which is North America. Um, now, I was going to talk about global history and some of the great uh, historians. I was actually going to talk about Eric Hobsbawm and Fernand Baudet, um, but I think I'll skip that. Uh, I was going to talk about the fact that, for all of their virtues, uh, uh, in, the, in the words of Benedict Anderson, uh, they are irremediably Eurocentric. And it's really true. Uh, Hobsbawm, uh, uh, for example, in his book uh, on the short century between 1914 and 1991, begins with epigraphs from 12 people. Every single epigraph is by a European. The short century between 1914 and 1991 was a European century? No, no, it's a world history. Uh, I can talk about Brodel in the same way. Uh, these were great historians. They're two of the best, two of the most sophisticated, and two of the most aware of their limitations in writing global history. Many levels below Baudin and below Hobsbawm, uh, there's a particularly trite popular version of what purports to be global history. Um, from this trite, in this trite version, Global history begins in 1492. The fact that what Columbus was doing in 1492 was waiting on the court of Fernand and Isabel, who were doing what? <laughs> they were attending the siege of Granada, finishing the Reconquista. So the Columbus episode is part of a history that in this version, this trite version of global, is completely effaced. The fact that the Spanish and the Portuguese had been engaged in a war, which the circumnavigation of the globe was a continuation of, is completely elided from that history. Nobody's aware of it. And you go to, to, to Granada today, and they tell you, they met Columbus here. Well, it's a city now. It was the camp of the two, of the, of the, of the two monarchs, the two Catholic monarchs, uh, in their siege of Granada. And when they received him, they received him as part of the same campaign that they were engaged in. This is a perfect example of what is missed uh, in this false starting point, which elides the fact that there was global history long before the age of European discovery and domination. Um, this is not just a matter of antiquarian interest. It can be seen from the lasting influence of some of the patterns that were established long before the age of European hegemony, whether we're talking about the abiding influence of China on its uh, environments and its astonishing global reach up to the 15th century, whether we're talking about the impact of uh, the revelations uh, to 
delivered in Arabic to an obscure Hijazi merchant, which 1,400 years later have produced an impact on a billion people the world over. This is global history. The expansion of Islam is global history. Uh, the, uh, the, the way in which China has related to its environments is global history. Um, in the United States, there was a fashionable discussion of something that was called the Pacific Rim, which was essentially some cover for American strategic thinking. Um, there was a much more long-lasting and fruitful community than whatever was built up around the Pacific Rim uh, in the 20th century. And this is the one built up over millennia around the Indian Ocean Rim, one that was obscured from the moment that the Portuguese and the Dutch and the British, in their violent fashion, uh, turned the Indian Ocean into another European lake. Uh, to this day, connections around the Indian Ocean between South Asia, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, uh, uh, East Africa, uh, that antecede and have nothing to do with Euro-American Euro hegemony uh, uh, form uh, a very important reality. Now, this historical myopia, which starts everything in 1492, also prevents us from considering events in a longer time frame than the one that's measured uh, in terms of a few centuries of Euro-American hegemony. Uh, in the Middle East and here, and in East Asia, and West Africa, and many other parts of the non-first world, if you will, uh, uh, such a time frame is present in the minds of people uh, who have a sense of the past, which stretches for millennia uh, in terms of the way language is developed and the, in the way, the way uh, history is understood. Um, now, obviously, such a long view can be abused and exploited by modern-day nationalists or nativists but it reflects a strongly held sense on the part of people in the non-West that history did not start with the advent of Western colonial modernity. Uh, that's a quintessential Orientalist assumption, uh, seeing the East as static and unchanging. I need to tell you uh, about Sayyid's ideas uh, relating to Orientalism, but it's also embedded in the construction of the modern social sciences, which privilege the forms taken by the economy, the society, and the politics of the metropole. Um, the subject of political science, at least as taught in the United States, is not all politics everywhere. Nor is the template that they use in political science a universal template. It is rather the study of the politics of a few specific Western countries. The forms derived from the systems of these countries and the methodologies used to study them are assumed to be universally applicable to other societies. In the original construction of the social sciences, only the West had real politics, real economics, and a real society worthy of sociology. The rest of us had none of these things. We either had stagnant, ancient civilizations, which had lost their civilizational impetus to be studied by Orientalists and philologists, in terms of timeless texts, uh, which were seen to embody our essential, unchanging nature. Otherwise, we were composed of primitive societies to be studied by anthropologists in terms of our quaint culture and customs. To this day, the hard social sciences in the United States are extraordinarily weak in their treatment of non-Western societies. In light of all of this, I've laid out a picture that's not very pleasant, I think. In light of all of this, how can one change these ingrained habits of mind and these well-entrenched structures for the production of knowledge which mirror power realities. And where, and I now want to talk a little bit about the Middle East, where does the Middle East come in when we talk about the history of the 20th century? One could do the same thing for South Asia or East Asia or Latin America. I'm going to do it about the Middle East briefly. Um, now, I have no solutions to the, or real, real answers to the questions I've asked you. How do you change these ingrained mind, habits of mind? Uh, every culture, Every civilization privileges its own narrative. This is natural, this is understandable. In light of Euro-American ascendancy for a couple of centuries, this tendency has been reinforced by the arrogance that goes with power. And given the relationship between power and knowledge, it's of course not surprising that, that to contest the construct of Western civilization uh, and the ineffable uh, uh, sense of superiority that goes with it is a difficult task. Um, but I think it can be argued that this can be done, and this can only be done in terms of producing narratives of world history 
that are generated elsewhere, <coughs> that are generated in terms of a new and less exclusivist genealogy. Um, and that this is a function of changes that are, I think, already visible in the way the world functions in the 21st century. And it should influence the way we go back and look at the 20th century. If, in fact, there are at least two major countries, and possibly a half dozen, that clearly are going to be considerably more important in the 21st century than they were in the 20th. Obviously, India is one of them. Obviously, China is another. There are probably others. Then the way in which we look at the 20th century really has to be changed. Euro-American ascendancy may continue into the 21st century for a bit, maybe more than a bit. But, and there may not be such a thing as a decline of American power in the next year or 10 or 3 or 15. Uh, historians do not have as part of their job description predicting the future. I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. It's not our job. We don't do that. Um, but I think that from the perspective of people who study the Middle East, which is a region which has been suffering through a very long period of the absence of democracy, extraordinarily poor educational systems, rampant religious reaction, um, and the dominance of sclerotic elites, which refuse to leave power, um, and which has a vexed relationship with a still domineering West, you can begin to see how you might chart a different uh, view. It would be much easier from Delhi. It would be much easier from Beijing, or from Mumbai, or from Shanghai, than it is from the Middle East. But even from the Middle East, some of these trends, I think, are visible. Um, and let me conclude by suggesting uh, uh, a couple of lines of inquiry about how we might re-envision, not the entire history of the 20th century, but at least how we might re-envision the place of the Middle East in the history of the 20th century, and thereby rethink the 20th century. I think it would be much easier to do from a South Asian perspective, or an East Asian perspective. What I'm suggesting from the Middle East is so much harder because of the current status of the Middle East in the early 21st century. I mean, we write history in the present, and the present influences how we see the past. And from the perspective of the Middle East, the appalling present makes it so much harder uh, to uh, uh, properly understand uh, the 20th century. From here and from other places, I think it might be easier. But let me do, try and do it from uh, uh, the, the perspective of the Middle East. And I'm going to do this by talking about a couple of things. I want to talk first about strategy and geography. I want to talk secondly about energy in the Middle East. And I want to talk thirdly about urban agglomerations, major world cities, focusing on a couple in the Middle East. But by extension, you can see where I'm going with this idea. Now, I've long thought that the Middle East has a much more important strategic place in 20th century world history than is usually recognized. Um, if you think, for example, of the way the history of the two world wars is written, um, and you think about the fact that in both world wars, the Middle East was a major combat theater, but in some, in some periods, at some stages, a decisive combat theater. And if you think about the fact that during the Cold War, the Middle East was the scene of intense superpower rivalry. It's a subject that I spent a lot of time working on. You realize that there is actually a skewed portrayal of the 20th century in terms of strategy. The campaigns in Palestine and Gallipoli and Mesopotamia, the campaigns in World War II in North Africa and Syria in the Mediterranean, those, the, the, the Nazi drive across southern Russia towards the Middle East and across North Africa, uh, towards Egypt. Um, all of these things, whether in World War I or World War II, all of these things in the way in which the history of that World War is written, or both World Wars are, are written, tends to be treated as no more than sideshows. The important theaters of these wars were in Western Europe, or in World War II, Western Europe and the Pacific. Uh, similarly, the unfolding of the Cold War focuses on Berlin, focuses on Cuba, focuses on the wars in East Asia, Korea, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, uh, all of which, of course, were important. But in some readings, the Cold War started over the Straits, over Karzai Ardahan, 
over northern Iran over in 1945 and 46, long before the Berlin crisis. Uh, the Iranian and Turkish uh, uh, Soviet relationship was the focus of American Cold Warriors. Um, and this continued. Uh, through the entire course of the Arab-Israeli conflict. It was a major battleground for influence between the superpowers. 48 and 56, both were on the same side. 1948 supporting Israel, 1956 supporting Egypt. After that, uh, they took different sides. And th these were enormously important uh, uh, battlefields of the Cold War. The second most important nuclear crisis of the Cold War came after the Cuban Missile Crisis, came in the 1973 war. It's the only time the United States went on a nuclear alert, besides the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Completely ignored in the literature. Only Middle East specialists even pay attention to it. It was an enormously important episode. Um, these are all examples of how important in geographic and strategic terms uh, uh, the Middle East was. Hitler could have changed the course of the war had the two pincers, one operating southwards across Russia towards the oil regions of the Transcaspian, and the other working across North Africa and towards Egypt and ultimately towards Iraq, had those two pincers closed. Had he not, had he mistakenly, uh, had he not mistakenly attacked Leningrad and attacked <coughs> Moscow, had he focused on the, those two pincers, had he devoted the entire resources of the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe to those two pincers, he would have taken all of the oil of the Soviet Union and the British Empire. They were entirely dependent on those two sources of oil. The course of World War II would have been different. Nazis may have lost. Ultimately, the Soviet Union and the United States probably would have won. The entire course of the war would have been different had the uh, strategic incompetence of, of, of Hitler himself and his high command uh, uh, allowed uh, for a different focus. Um, now, we all know why the Middle East is important. We all know uh, that it has an extraordinary strategic relevance because of what's north of it, what's south of it, and so forth. All of this uh, became even more important during the Cold War. Um, I could go into how and why, uh, for both superpowers, uh, deployment of weapon systems, deployment of fleets, uh, establishing bases was vital. Uh, I won't go into it. Uh, the strange thing is that the end of the Cold War did not diminish the Middle East's significance. Even before 9-11, the Middle East had become the primary locus for U.S. power. By the end of the 20th century, the United States devoted more of its forces to the Middle East and adjacent regions than any other part of the world. Clearly, there is some enormous strategic importance to this region, not only in World Wars I and II, not only in the Cold War, but even in the post-Cold War era. My point here is that the recurring importance of the Middle East to global strategy throughout this century, this 20th century, is hardly reflected in the way the history of the century is written, uh, with that heavy Euro-American focus. Um, and the impact of global affairs on this region uh, had an effect on the course of world history. In other words, what the Europeans and Americans did in the Middle East engendered events that had world historical importance. Let me give you one small example. The British, the Americans, and the Russians Soviets occupied Iran in 1941. Okay? They maintained their occupation in 1946. What did this do? It, it undermined monarchical power. It enabled the reestablishment of a parliamentary regime. What did that parliamentary regime do? It nationalized Iranian oil. What did that do? Provoked an Anglo-American coup in 1953, which removed the last constitutional parliamentary government in Iran. That, in turn, led to the 1979 Iranian Revolution. So here we have an example of something that's done by the United States and the Soviets and the, and the Brits, made, and then later on by the Americans and the British in 1953, which produces uh, what I would argue is a world historical revolution, the Iranian Revolution. So I've talked about strategy. I've talked about ge geography. Let me briefly talk about energy. Because of its energy reserves, very early in the 20th century, the Middle East became the target of the ambitions of energy-hungry global powers and their profit-hungry oil companies. Um, and these interactions between these, the actions of these powers and the domestic politics of the oil-producing countries uh, has produced worldwide effects, many of them completely unrecognized in, 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 in certainly Western discourse. 
These effects range from the oil nationalization that I just talked about in 1953, the Arab oil boycott of 1973, and the shock to the world economy that followed, the Iranian revolution, the Iran-Iraq war, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, and so forth. The American occupation of Iraq, which is a 21st century phenomenon. Um, other interactions between great power, uh, the great powers and the politics of the Middle East uh, that were not as obviously related to the politics of energy, but which in fact were driven by energy and by oil, were the murderous attacks in the 1990s against U.S. targets in the Middle East and Africa, and on September 11th, 2001, uh, the attacks on the United States itself. Now you may say, what does that have to do with energy? The people who did these things were largely Saudis. And any time, everything related to Saudi Arabia involves oil. <coughs> Saudi Arabia is what it is because of oil. Saudi regime is founded on oil. Saudi Arabia's importance and connection to the United States is related to oil. Saudi Arabia is the oldest American outpost outside of the Western Hemisphere. It antedates the expansion of the United States after World War II. It started in 1933. It's the oldest American relationship in the old world that is a geopolitical, economic relationship. And it is a function of uh, 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 a pre-imperial American understanding of its role in the world after 1945. Uh, it's not a coincidence that the, that the, the person who was responsible, uh, whose administration was responsible for supporting the American oil companies that later formed what's called Aramco was uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had been Assistant Secretary of the Navy during World War I when the American Navy shifted over to oil. He understood oil. He understood the strategic importance of oil. He understood that the 20th century was going to be a century driven by oil. And so, at a time when the United States was still isolationist, he pushed this connection. And in, in the dying days of his administration, in his dying days, Roosevelt took a whole day on his way back from Yalta to stop and meet with him in Saturday in 1945 in Egypt. Tired day, the man died a couple of, a few weeks later. But it was that important for him that he met uh, Ibn Saud. So anything relating to Saudi Arabia relates to oil. And these individuals who blew up the, 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 the Twin Towers and did a variety of other things were largely Saudis, masterminded by a Saudi. Uh, 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 these were not local events. These were world historical events with a global impact. Um, and they have to be explained in terms of energy. Uh, they have to be explained in terms of these phenomena that I've just been talking about. Now, we cannot know the history of the fourth future, but I would bet that energy and the related issue of the environment and how these relate to economic costs and quality of life are going to be important issues in the 21st century. I would, I would gamble on that, I think. I think you can, you can take that one to the bank. Uh, and when any future examination of how these issues played out turns back to look at the 20th century. When we want to understand why the 21st century was as it was, where our children or grandchildren want to understand why the 21st century was as it was, uh, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be necessary to pay very careful attention to how the world became dependent on Middle Eastern energy. Because it's going to continue to be dependent on Middle Eastern for a while. And it will focus in particular on how that energy dependence linked global stability and the global economy and, 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 and problems of, of world terrorism to the unstable politics of Middle Eastern monarchies and other Middle Eastern autocracies that were themselves destabilized by external intervention, motivated by the competition for energy. In other words, we're going to have to figure out how the rivalry of powers over energy produced the particular, peculiar, perverse regimes which in turn are necessary to the political economy of oil. That explains so much more than the uh, pseudo-discipline uh, pseudo of terrorology which purports to explain <laughs> why terrorism takes place. Understand the political economy of Saudi Arabia and the American-Saudi relationship, understand the, the, the religious economy of Wahhabism, and you will understand many things that are invisible in world history, not in Saudi history or the history of Islam. Now this brings me to my final tentative suggestion about how we might rethink the history of the 20th century. 
in a way that pays, prop, that pays proper attention to non-Euro-America. I will talk about the Middle East, but the same uh, things that I say will be applied to other parts of the world. And this has to do with what we study when we study history. Approaches to history have changed over time, of course. Once upon a time, the study of the subject matter of history was determined by a religious teleology. Then, for a long time, it focused on emperors and kings and battles and political history. Thereafter, the sovereign nation state became the main subject of history about the time that the discipline was professionalized. Then with the rise of the Anand school, uh, history began to examine society and economy. More, recent, more recently, the history of daily life and other more granular forms of history have been the subject of uh, the interest of historians. But in each of these phases, kings and battles, before that religion, after that the nation state, and so forth, it's been largely a, a sovereign Euro-American nation states, or the economies and societies of Euro-America, or the daily lives of New Yorkers or Parisians or whatever that got the most attention. I'm suggesting that it's necessary to look at the history of the economies, of the societies, of the daily lives of non-Euro-Americans, especially through the lens of the growth of great world cities outside Euro-America. Beijing, Shanghai, Mumbai, Delhi, Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Istanbul, Cairo. These are all mega cities of over 10 million people. Um, the largest of them is actually Mumbai. Um, the smallest of them is Istanbul, Sao Paulo, and Beijing, which are 11 million people. They're very big cities. Many of them are imperial capitals, former imperial. This one is a former imperial capital. Beijing is a former Istanbul. Others are not. Um, several of them um, have been studied carefully by scholars, but generally by scholars who are specialists in their own societies, but never, to my knowledge, as part of a class of world cities that, are, that defined the end of the 20th century. Uh, never together, never together with other uh, Euro-American cities. Um, these are among the very largest cities on the planet, and they were at the end of the 20th century, um, yet they're rarely considered when the term world city is mentioned. Uh, I would argue that the history of the growth of these cities, of how their vocation and role have changed, of how they've become the enormous hubs, cultural, economic, and so forth, of regions that go well beyond the boundaries of the nation. Mumbai is the capital of the Gulf, okay? It's the economic capital of Bollywood and many other things. But it's the capital of the Gulf. It is the actual center of much of what happens in the Gulf. And I'm not talking about labor flows, and I'm not just talking about capital flows or culture. It is actually the pole around which an enormous amount of activity uh, in, in areas well beyond the boundaries of the Indian nation state uh, focus. It's a world city. It's part of an Indian Ocean rim, which includes other world cities, southern East Africa, southern Southeast Asia, and so forth. That is something that deserves attention, not just by anthropologists, but by historians, understanding these trends. Uh, I give that as an example. I could say the same thing about Istanbul. Istanbul has an impact in the Balkans, almost as great in some respects as at the height of the Ottoman Empire. It has an impact on the southern areas of what used to be the Soviet Union, including Transcaucasia and so forth, as great as when the Ottomans ruled the Crimea. It has an impact on the Arab world in some respects greater than when the Ottomans ruled much of the Arab world, because it is a global pole in economic and cultural terms, which has enormous range, far beyond the narrow, straightened, bigoted confines of the Turkish nation state. It has nothing to do with Turkey, uh, Istanbul. It's a global city. It's a, it's a regional pole. It's a global pole. And looking at these things, I would argue, um, is absolutely uh, essential to understanding both looking backwards at the 20th century for us historians and looking at other phenomena for other social scientists. Obviously, obviously, it's easier for some historians to work in New York or to work in Los Angeles or to work in London, where the languages are easier to learn, the archives are better organized, they're more comfortable, you don't have to, you don't have to travel as much if you're in a, a, a Euro-American. But the global cities that I mentioned, uh, I'm, for me, the interest would be Cairo and Istanbul, but they're all important. 
uh, are already among the most dynamic urban centers in the world. How this came about and what this means about the change over the past century and the relations between the old center and what used to be the periphery and what is now going to sooner or later become centers, um, I think, is a worthy subject for any global historian, uh, would-be global historian of the 20th century. Um, now, I'll conclude by saying that the history of the 20th century is going to change as time passes. It's not inscribed and stumped. What people read as the history of the 20th century in 2020 is going to be different than what we see it as today in 2014. Um, that's, a, that's a truism, obviously. Um, but we're going to get a different perspective as time goes on, on the 20th century. But I think it's already time, even only 14 years after it ended, to reappraise the excessive focus on a few Western countries in the writing of the history of that century. Um, this is essentially a call for less parochialism. It's not only directed at Euro-American historians. Uh, for those of us, for those of them who are less familiar with our history, non-Western history, I, I do have a message. I'm not being, I'm not entirely innocent in suggesting that they're, they're missing something. Um, but I think for all historians, and not just for Middle East historians or historians based in the Middle East, for us, for South Asians, for East Asians, for Africans, I think the message is the same. All of us are going to have to be broader in our view. All of us are going to have to break the parochialism uh, of our region. They, they provincialized Europe uh, brilliantly. The Depeche has provincialized Europe brilliantly. I think we have to break with the provincialism we all uh, suffer from. And I think we have to understand better the world historical currents that affect the non-Euro-American world as well as the internal forces that roil these worlds that we live in. So, to conclude, we all have work to do. Thank you very much.